Hello, it's Ryan. This is part two of our final astronomy lecture. Uh, this is perhaps the only lecture that we'll be looking at the universe with a different lens. We'll be looking with more of a strong anthropic lens instead of the more common and weak anthropic lens that we were originally using. I hope that that makes sense. What we're going to do today is look at two things. We're going to preface this with a reminder as to what the conditions for life are. So the conditions for life define the four conditions that we think an entity must have to be considered a living organism. So we're going to start with something that doesn't seem very astronomical, but is, of course, and entirely astronomical, as we all are. I think we are all made of star stuff anyway. So the conditions of, for life, the following four conditions uh, must hold true if we're going to classify an organism as living. The organism must be able to reproduce. Even single-cell bacteria reproduce. They more, like, multiply, but... An organism must be able to metabolize. Metabolize, or in other words, it must be able to take in and transform energy to survive. It must be able to use energy from its environment. So it must be able to metabolize energy. We think in order to be alive, you must be able to respond to external stimuli. You must be able to respond to external stimuli. Have you ever seen a tree respond to external stimuli? Well, you have, believe it or not. If you've ever seen trees change the direction that they're pointed to get more sunlight, it just takes a little bit longer for a tree to respond. Trees produce sap to help heal the wounds that they could, uh, they could incur. That actually leads me to my fourth and final point. They must be able to grow and repair themselves. So going into this lecture, we want to keep in mind that in order to be classified as living, you have to meet these four criteria. And the reason I'm prefacing with this is because we're going to look at the Big Bang Theory one more time, uh, but we're going to look at it again with, through the lens of a strong anthropic principle sort of outlook. We're going to be focused on potential use or potential purposes for life, maybe trying to answer the lifelong question as to why are we here. Now I'm going to preface with, I don't know the answer to that, but... So keep in mind these conditions. This is what it takes for you to be. And uh, we're going to then note what we're really going to talk about today is the Big Bang Theory. But it's with a twist. A human twist. And so the way I'm going to do this is with uh, uh, another timeline. We're going to start, of course, with the Big Bang event. So there it is, in all its glory. And from that, we will have time and space be created. I'm not going to worry about any weird shapes today. It'll just be a nice straight timeline that will go on because I don't think we've made it to the end yet. We're still here to watch these fun videos. This represents the Big Bang event. And what we're going to do here is put approximately... Uh, 11 or 12 ticks, so we'll go 1... Uh, 
that's pretty good. And we're going to label a few of these things. We're going to start uh, with, well, we're going to label all of them. After the Big Bang event, we, of course, will get to a point where matter is created. The creation of matter. Soon after matter is created, it will eventually conglomerate and form proto-galaxies and proto-clusters. So this is all not, this is, none of this is new information. This is all covered in the Big Bang lecture, but. So we have proto-galaxies and proto-stars. From proto-galaxies and proto-stars, we'll get galaxies and clusters. Finally, our home forms the Milky Way galaxy, our favorite galaxy, right? Soon after our Milky Way forms, we get the sun and our solar system. including Earth. And about 0.8 billion years later, we get life. Wonderful, beautiful, prokaryotic life. Over a billion years after that, we finally get multicellular life, though I did hypothesize in our last class that it's very possible that the prokaryotic cells were acting as multicellular organisms long before there were multicellular organisms, which is a little mind-blowing if you ask me. We had simple animals and plant life. simple animals and plants. We think uh, next we finally get complex animals. Again, this is, uh, I'm kind of flying through this because you do have a much longer explanation of some of this in our previous class. I'm going to leave this one blank and I'm going to go to the next one, which is when mammals happen. We love mammals. We are mammals. From mammals come primates. And of course, eventually we get humans. And I maybe should add one more tick. Do you think that there will be another evolution after humans on our planet? I'm going to put a tick there just in case. We don't know what that is, of course. Okay, so I've set up our timeline with some of the key things that I wanted to talk about. But what I want to add to this is something, again, that is much more anthropic than normal. And so right about here, right about here, I'm going to put a big arrow. And I'm going to bring this up to there, we think that around this point, around this point, soon after we get multicellular organisms, life must have developed an awareness. Life must have developed an awareness. And so we know as soon as we get to this point, when we get single cellular prokaryotic life, these criteria must be true. These single cells must be adhering to these criteria because they're living. We think that potentially they were acting as multicellular even though they were single cellular organisms, but they definitely held to those criteria. That being said, 
we now are arguing uh, that awareness could have happened for those single cellular organisms. We do know now that those organisms can count how many of themselves there are relative to other single cellular organisms. So this awareness is arguably in the wrong place already due to the studies we're crea- we've been making and learning about single cellular organisms. This could potentially be here. But that's an argument for another day. We think that by the time we had multicellular organisms, those organisms were developing a sense of awareness. I left this other tick blank because I wanted to make a very large arrow that goes to that tick. We think that at some point after animals became complex, we think that they probably developed some sort of self-awareness. Some sort of self-awareness. The ability to distinguish themselves from the environment around them. And that's a big step when it comes to consciousness. And if you haven't caught on yet, that's what I'm really getting at, is the type of consciousness that the life on our planet exhibits. Arguably, awareness is enough to say that a life has consciousness, but it really feels like getting to the to a, a point of self-awareness, being able to distinguish yourself from your environment is fundamentally more important when it comes to trying to be an intelligent species. So when we talk about awareness, it's almost the first step to what we think human consciousness is or any sort of consciousness is. Do you, do you have a pet? Do you have a dog or a cat or a guinea pig or a gerbil? Do you have any snails at home? <clears throat> Hermit crabs? Are those animals aware? Do you think that those animals have consciousness, even the hermit crab? Are those animals self-aware? Are they aware that they're separate from their environment? When a hermit crab leaves its shell and finds a new home, it must have some awareness of its boundaries, where its body begins and where it ends, in order to find the correct size uh, shell. So these complex animals arguably <clears throat> almost entirely have self-awareness. <clears throat> Do trees have self-awareness? I like to think that trees are aware. Trees can respond to external stimuli, but is a tree aware of where its bark ends and the bugs that live in the bark begin? I don't know. <clears throat> Some of our studies into chemical uh, discussions and chemical um, language may prove to help in the future, but right now I don't think that we consider trees to be self-aware. <laughs> Do you think an intelligent species like Homo sapiens, do you think that their consciousness stops at just being self-aware? <clears throat> it turns out that with our mental abilities, we think that we possess something even deeper than self-awareness. We think we possess personal self-consciousness. And we think that personal self-consciousness was developed or first evolved to ha be had by certain mammals. Uh, and so we're going to note that personal self-consciousness is kind of what we think the last evolution of consciousness is. Personal self-consciousness is not only being aware of yourself, but being aware of that awareness. Huh. Have you ever saw, thought and wondered how or why you think? 
how or why you're the person that you are? Why is your consciousness bound to your mind? Why don't you have the ability to surf between different bodies? What even binds you to that? I don't know. Anyway, thinking about really philosophical questions indicates that you have a personal self-consciousness. Trying to conceptualize your awareness. I ask my dogs every day if they are aware of their self-consciousness, and every day they do not reply. I grab them by the heads and bring mine right up to their snout, and I say, are you aware? Do you know you have awareness? And if I'm lucky, they just lick me right in the face. And I usually take that as a yes, absolutely, but you never really know, do you? Do you think that primates sit around and wonder about their awareness? Arguably they do. Humans always and certainly do. If you'd like, you could always add what you think the next evolutionary step on our planet is, but we could note that perhaps right here is now. And so this is another point of view on the Big Bang Theory. This one is focused more on humans and awareness. And the reason I'm bringing this up is to give you a different point of view on maybe our purpose in the universe. We evolved over the course of billions of years in this universe. We learned from the Drake equation that we're potentially not the only life in the universe or even maybe in our Milky Way galaxy. And we know that we've developed personal self-consciousness, the ability to look in and out of ourselves and of the universe and to perceive and conceptualize and think about what that means. We get to look into the universe and create theories like the Big Bang Theory and give purpose to something that otherwise may have just been some random conglomeration of atoms. What I'm really trying to do <clears throat> is not only make you aware of your own personal self-consciousness, a new way to think about your thoughts, but potentially give you some hope that you're more than just you. That this universe that allowed us and you to evolve and be created and be born here on this wonderful planet, this universe did that for a purpose, that maybe you can be the eyes and ears of the universe. Maybe you allow the universe itself to have personal self-consciousness. Would the universe know about its amazing light shows when a star explodes and creates all of the elements that will soon potentially create life in a different galaxy? Or would it just do that and eventually die to heat death? Do we get to keep track and watch the glorious show and be part of the potentially much larger consciousness all around us. Something to think about. All of these wonderful and astronomical ideas, they really all depend on our point of view and our studies at this point. And until we're lucky enough to discover other life or other theories or other phenomena that we've yet to observe, we're stuck here on Earth with our perception, and hopefully we can allow the universe a new perception as well. I've had so much fun with you this semester. I hope that you got to leave astronomy having learned, grown, and with a new appreciation for the universe and phenomena around us. I hope to talk to you soon.